Good afternoon and welcome to CAE's first virtual panel discussion on diversity and inclusion, how suppliers can make a difference. Bienvenue à la toute première table ronde virtuelle de CAE sur la diversité et l'inclusion, la différence que peuvent faire nos fournisseurs. My name is Salima Lalji. I am a senior subcontracts manager within Global Strategic Sourcing at CAE, and it is my privilege to be your moderator for today's event. The panel discussion and guest speaker presentation will be in English, but the slides that will be displayed will be in English and French. La table ronde ainsi que la présentation de notre conférencière se tiendront aujourd'hui en anglais, mais les diapositives seront en anglais et français. À la fin des présentations, nous tiendrons une période de questions-réponses où vous pourrez poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Today's agenda is as follows. Bernard Ross, Vice President, Global Strategic Sourcing and Real Estate Services, will make introductory remarks on the importance of diversity and inclusion for CAE followed by a discussion with two esteemed panelists, Chloé Caron and David Ako, on diversity and inclusion from a supplier's perspective, concluding with a presentation by none other than Sylvia Pensac, the president of Women Business Enterprises Canada Council. We will have a question answer session in the end. On the top right corner of your screen, you will see a question mark icon this is where you can ask your questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Bernard Ross. Bernard joined CAE in August 2019 as Director of Global Strategic Sourcing and was recently appointed as Vice President, Global Strategic Sourcing and Real Estate Services. Bernard has over 20 years of procurement experiences. He worked at Pratt & Whitney Canada for 14 years, where he progressed to the position of Associate Director of Global Strategic Sourcing, where he led UTC's corporate indirect product procurement strategy. Previously, Bernard worked at Future Electronics in Montreal and at Motorola in Ireland in planning and procurement. Welcome, Bernard. Thank you, Salima. What a great introduction, a great way to kick off uh, this uh, forum on diversity and inclusion. So um, I'll get straight into it. You've heard who I am, so uh, welcome everyone. I, I'm super excited and privileged actually to be part of uh, this panel and this uh, review today with all of you. Uh, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and my organization's heart. So. Uh, We'll get straight into it and I uh, will go over maybe just to uh, to really kick it off of what CAE is doing on its journey to promote uh, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. You know, and there's uh, a few things we're doing. First is we've partnered with two great resource groups. One is CCDI, which is the Canadian Centre of Diversity and Inclusion, and the other is Pride at Work. And the importance of uh, partnering with uh, organizations like this is really to give us access to research, to data, to web webinars, to educate ourselves on the importance of diversity and inclusion and, and, and you know, the issues at hand, you know, I, I spent uh, last weekend reading a lot of stats on, uh, on the Pride at Work website and I was shocked, you know, with some of the disadvantages some of these minority groups face just on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, uh, I just want to share one with you. It's like five to twelve percent of Canada uh, considers themselves LGBTQ2+, uh, yet they represent twenty-five percent of homelessness in Canada. So it, it just took me back, you know. And then I dug further and I went into like. 89% of tr the trans population have university or a uh, certification qualified, yet 50% of them earn less than $30,000 a year. So that's just one simple example that really took my breath away and, and really 
reminded me of how important this journey is for all of us to give people opportunities out there in these categories. So, you know, part of what we've been doing uh, has given us some certifications and recognition from our peers. So, so you'll see uh, coming up is like, we, we have like women in governance, we've been recognized silver level certification and also with Bloomberg uh, 2021 gender equality, uh, some recognitions we've received because we've started this journey and we've been on it for a few years. And uh, maybe we'll see, uh, Sean, if you could move it forward. Uh, just those certifications just don't happen, right? There's initiatives that we do and the next column you'll see some of the initiatives that we have undertaken. So we've uh, signed up to the seven UN Women Empowerment Principles, and we've also committed to the 5030 Challenge, which is very interesting. I recommend you look into that, but it's 50% uh, gender parity for pay in the organization at senior management level and 30% at a senior manager level for all diverse groups. So a really, you know, really putting our name out there and really going towards that goal as an organization, you know, it makes me very proud. And, you know, one thing is setting objectives. They're very easy, right? It's what's behind those objectives. And you'll see that we have six employee resource groups, uh, Mosaic for parents with children with special needs. We have prison for the LGBTQ2 plus movement. We have LIFT for women in aviation and technology. We have EMBRACE for race and ethnicity. We have PWN for professional women's network, and we have Insignia for veterans. So we have these employee groups within CAE that work and share uh, ideas on all of these criteria. So a, a combination of all of these is helping us uh, drive DNI and promote it within CNA, CAE. CAE. So that's overall. So, you know, maybe let's review, I guess, what we're doing in supply chain, because I know today we have a lot of suppliers on the line and uh, I want to share what I'm doing as part of global strategic sourcing and what we're doing for the supply chain. So firstly, let's just maybe look at what, what we mean by supplier diversity versus just general diversity and inclusion. So what, what we mean by supplier diversity is a business practice that really encourages the advancement of historically underrepresented businesses in a company supply chain. So I guess the examples I gave on the previous slide, uh, you know, tell you why these groups, it's so important that we encourage the advancement of these groups within the supply chain, within large corporations like CAE. Uh, so, you know, the groups, I don't have to list them, but I will. Uh, just to remind everybody, they're women owned, they're visible minorities, indigenous people, the LGBTQ2 plus group, veterans, people with disabilities. They're the key large groups and we want to advance these groups within our supply chain. So how are we going to do that is I guess the million dollar question. So we're going to do it in two ways. Uh, the first way is through supplier diversity certification. So we want to encourage our suppliers that qualify as DNI suppliers to get certified. And you may say, why should I get certified? There's cost, yada, yada, yada. I'm doing great as I am. Really, more and more corporations like CAE are establishing targets and metrics internally. So how do we measure DNI, that's our challenge. So we are going to measure it through certification. So it's a way of knowing if you meet the criteria, it's not just an arbitrary measure. Uh, we will have clear validation that your company is diverse and inclusive. Now, that's one benefit of having certification. The second benefit will be that it will give us visibility in our supply chain to those who are diverse and inclusive, and we will be able to award business easier and quicker to these organizations. And it will also really differentiate you from the competition out there. So it really gives you a priority status in our supply chain. So that's the first element that we're doing. The second element we're gonna do 
is we're going to, well, we are actually, we're going live on December 6th, but we are launching SAP Ariba, which is a tool to manage our supply chain, uh, specifically suppliers. There's going to be only one way to work with CAE going forward as a supplier, and that is using the Ariba tool. Now, what will that Ariba tool do for CAE and supply chain? It gives me visibility on all my supplier spend globally, where you are, what you're doing, uh, what category you provide services for. And as we launch this tool, we're also going to launch AI and we're going to start pulling market intelligence and we're going to put in diversity criteria into this intelligence. So when we reach out to the supply chain, we're going to know who's diverse, who's not diverse, where the spend is, by country, by region, and we're going to be able to drive targets and KPIs globally uh, in that area. Now, some of you may say, well, I'm not a DNI supplier. That's fine. You're like CAE, but then the expectation is you have a roadmap a CSR corporate social responsibility roadmap which includes DNI you have a roadmap like CAE to encourage and embrace DNI suppliers in your supply chain so i guess one is for DNI suppliers the other is for suppliers like CAE where you're looking maybe you're still wondering how do we evolve uh, our DNI uh, you know uh, objectives and and this is this is one way right we're sharing with you today what we're doing you know very happy to share that information with anybody but our expectation around csr is that you have dni objectives going forward because they are going to be preferred suppliers for us to work with so i you know and the pyramid there you'll see what dni brings to an organization it really creates added value it promotes innovation it increases our competitiveness and reduces our costs. And, and you know, I, I really just want to say, like having a diverse workforce, I don't know for anybody out there that has a diverse workforce, you, you see the benefits of having diverse opinions, diverse skills, you know, so uh, it, it's evident to me because that's the type of team we have here at CAE, but uh, the benefits are, are endless. So, uh, I really encourage you to jump on this journey now. And uh, and finally, uh, in in closing, I guess I just want to share with you one the Global Strategic Sourcing Diversity and Inclusion Committee that we have here at CAE, led by Salima, who introduced uh, uh, the panel uh, this morning. So uh, thank you, Salima, for your leadership here. We have a group of six people. Uh, you know, and we're driving this roadmap. So, you know, to have six people focused on this initiative just in one group within CAE, I think says a lot about how serious we're taking this. And, you know, I kind of mentioned it, but I just really want to say, you know, that DNI is about capturing the uniqueness of people and individuals, right? And it's all about respecting uh, and recognizing their talents, their skills, their abilities. Uh, and if you do that, it will benefit the greater good of your organization. So on that, uh, Salima, I'm gonna hand it back to you and thank you very much for this opportunity this morning. Thank you, Bernard. Um, thank you for sharing the importance of diversity and inclusion for CAE and all of the initial initiatives that we've been taking. We're really happy to have you with us today. The challenge that we face in aerospace is that the participation of women, indigenous peoples, visible minorities, people with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ2 plus community in the Canadian aerospace industry is not at all representative of the population that it serves. So what can we do to improve this? I am thrilled to have with us today two remarkable panelists to share their thoughts and experiences as suppliers on this important topic. Chloé Caron and David carrière Ako. Chloé is the founder of O2 Coaching and the Empower Your Team movement with over 20 years of experience. She has supported thousands of executive leaders and their teams 
with changing corporate cultures and promoting the implementation of a leadership style based on inclusion, empowerment, and innovation. The methodology that Chloe has developed over the course of her many experiences is detailed in her book, Power Your Team. David is a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation in Saskatchewan and a proud member of the Canadian Armed Forces Reserves as officer in the Air Cadet Program, promoting development of Canada's youth and interest in aviation and aerospace. Since launching Aquasys in 2006, David has established himself and Aquasys as a premier Indigenous-led consulting firm specializing in facilitating Indigenous engagement on behalf of governments, corporate clients, and non-governmental organizations. In 2008, Aquasys created an Indigenous internship program providing the opportunity for Indigenous people across Canada to work and be mentored on their client projects. This has earned Aquasys numerous awards and newsworthy media artic articles. Welcome, Chloe and David. Thank you. Thank you, Salima. This is very humbling. <laughs> 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 thank you. Yeah, thank you very much as well. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. It's different when you hear it from a, from a different person, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, it's very humble. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us. Chloe, let's talk about you first. You founded a women owned company that has supported thousands of leaders in promoting diversity and inclusion, um, and you're WeBe certified as well. So, tell us more about your company. Yeah, so we actually we employ and to Bernard's point, you know, we really support diversity, not only outside for our client, how we support them, create that culture, but we do it also for O2. So we have difference in ages, difference in gender, differences in uh, uh, sexual orientation and uh, experience. So this is really key for us to not only do it for our clients, but to to represent that within within our own company. So I launched uh, in 2014, O2 Coaching, the vision was to give oxygen to leaders. And I think we need oxygen more than ever. <laughs> uh, we need oxygen for ourselves, but for our culture. And that's what we, that's our mission to, to help cult our organization build cultures where empowerment, inclusion is possible through a posture, through a different posture in leadership. And so we give tools to, to leaders to, to, to have that right posture. Yeah. Thank you. Hence the O2 oxygen. <laughs> Hence the O2, exactly. Hence the O2. Yeah, absolutely. And thank, thank you. you. David, your company is CAMC certified. So why don't you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So yeah, we're uh, CAMC is the Canadian Aboriginal Minority Suppliers Council. They're a, they're a mirror of the MNSDC, the uh, National Minority Supply Diversity Supplier. I think that's what they're called. Sorry, I get tied up with the acronyms. But this was a, an organization, MNSDC, started during the Nixon years, you know, so they've been around for a while and they've really moved the needle in terms of, you know, minority supplier development. CAMC has taken the same model and has brought it over to, to Canada. Um, so being a member of CAMC kind of basically opened up the, the doors to do work with the, uh, um, you know, with Corporate Canada. And in fact, ironically, it was Corporate Canada that gave us the, the, the uh, you know, the supplier credibility, if you want to say, you know, because we had project references and we had um, not only that, but spend to do work with government. And it took us three years to do work with government. So you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, for a business, you know, their first year survival is always the most critical year of survival. But we had to do like wait three years to do business with government. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so this was one of the facilitations that uh, CAMC has done for us. And we started our business in 2006. And we've been members of CAMC since 2007. And then it permeated other, other organizations as well, which includes the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business and uh, CANDU, which really deals with the, the economic development offices uh, across uh, all Indigenous uh, communities, both on and off reserve. So, yeah, so it's, it's a big networked approach. <laughs> That's what I say. I'll take a pause there. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's quite interesting. And you've come a long way. Um, I'm curious, what uh, made both of you get certified? So maybe Chloe, you can start. 
I, I was actually introduced to certification uh, recently, fairly recently. So I was I started my business as I mentioned in 2014, and it's not only until 2020 that I got certified that we got O2 certified, thanks to an organization here in Quebec that is called RFAQ, the Réseau des Femmes d'Affaires du Québec. So I got acquainted with WeBe and WeConnect, and for me it was it became really clear that this was an opportunity. I think uh, Bernard mentioned the obvious um, reasons to do it, but it became very clear in terms of visibility, credibility, and access to, to um, clients that were willing to support business that were uh, women-owned. And it became really clear that this would open my network. And it would also, and that probably is as critical, would also bring me in a state of a different state of mind where I wasn't just uh, a solopreneur, but I was now becoming a official supplier uh, as a woman owned company, which shifted things even for me as a business owner. Interesting. David, you, you've been counseling certified, as you mentioned, for quite a while now. So mm -hmm. how did you get to that? What made you make, take that decision? You know, it was really a strange uh, uh, set of circumstances. Um, I got an email, and I do not know from who. <laughs> I just said you should go to this, uh, 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 you know, this event called Campsy uh, that was in Ottawa. And I kind of looked at my business partner and said, "You want a road trip? <laughs> you know, just just up the road." Uh, and uh, so I went to a Campsy event, um, and was, they've been around. It was the first year of existence in Canada, and uh, there. Um, uh, where I was just learning about certification and the value of certification. I never thought about certification as being being an option. Um, but when uh, I got to the event and I realized there was HP there, there was uh, other companies that were just starting up as members, and just, just being able to chat and be able to turn around and tell what our mission was, because we had a very interesting mission, being social entrepreneurs, as as you pointed out, right? We started a, a, a Indigenous internship, and that really, you know, caught the attention of the of Corporate Canada. Um, they were just starting to really start understanding about uh, supplier diversity uh, and the business case for it. Government was putting a lot of pressure on, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, first tier suppliers uh, like the CAUs of the world, the HPs, and uh, to do business with indigenous suppliers. So this is one of the the catalysts that they were using in order to a find indigenous suppliers or or minority suppliers, but also uh, to to build their business case. You know, making sure that they they can um, find the qualified suppliers. So uh, that's what the CAMC ecosystem early on uh, showed to me uh, in being able to 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 have access directly to the you know corporate Canada, but also uh, on a very intimate level, one to one, you can't can't get better than that. Um, and uh, but also uh, giving us the reach because we go to all the conferences. And um, but more uh, as uh, Chloe had pointed out, is the uh, the credibility side of it. You know, mm -hmm. we are you know an indigenous supplier. Someone has vetted us. Someone has you know um, uh, you know vouched for industry that we, we're we're an indigenous supplier and yeah so that's how that's how it all started an email chance meeting and a willingness to go and see so yeah. wow that's uh that's quite an interesting way to uh to have started this whole process <laughs> this is very different for sure yeah. um so before we get into to talking more about certification and the benefits, talk to me more about diversity and inclusion. What does it mean for, for your respective companies? Chloe. Well, as I mentioned, for me, it's it's I, I need to look at it, and I think everybody needs to look at it from an internal and external. So we need to look at it from our how we lead within our own group or company, and are we showing up uh, with diversity? Are we a good representation of that? If only for good business reasons, because as Bernard said, you know, it's it just creates more innovation. It just creates more depth to what we create. So I think we need to look at it from internally, but also um, how do we support organization? And I have the privilege with O2 to directly impact that. How do we support organization build that? First of all, I think, and, and before we, we came online, you know, David and I were talking about just the increase in awareness of the biases that in 2021, everybody's aware, 
they might not be totally there in their in the way of working, but everybody is aware that we need to support uh, diversity. Yeah, I, I hope I hope that's what they think. Perhaps what they're thinking is they're aware that there are differences and they need to be aware of that. Hopefully they're at that point where they, they think they, they need to make a difference. But uh, and diversity and inclusion. And I'll stop on this. For me, the, the real definition of that is diversity is having a group that has a different perspective around the table, a different experience altogether. And inclusion is how you bring that multitude of voices together. And as a leader, what do you do to make sure that you have diversity around the table, but also inclusion of that diversity in the decision making, in the challenging of the way we do things, in the contribution to decision and, and the vision that we're, we're, we're putting out there. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the vision here. Very nicely said, uh, Chloe. Let's talk more about your discussion that you had with David before we uh, before we started this discussion on unconscious bias or bias in general. David, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I can give you the indigenous perspective. Um, okay. You know, unconscious unconscious biases are you know uh, first of all, I, I think they're like they're insidious. You know, that kind of thing because you don't even realize you're. You're, you know, you're, you're biasing, uh, you know, a group of individuals. Well, whether it's the LGBTQ community or women-owned businesses, or from from, from an indigenous perspective, uh, you know, you don't you don't have to pick up the paper, you know, you, you just you know to see it. And there's so many negative stories about the indigenous community, about alcoholism, about um, you know, poverty, bad housing, and so on and so forth. Uh, so automatically, that kind of puts indigenous people in negative light. Now imagine if you're a procurement, you know, a person that's got to, you know, make sure you get the best value for money. You make sure your budget, your your projects are coming in on time, and so on and so forth. And you look at this indigenous supply, and you go, oh, I'm not 100 sure I want to do business because of all these particular issues. You don't mean to do it, you know, but you you do that. Um, and I think that really impacts, you know, um, you know, the inclusion of, let's say, indigenous suppliers, you know, or even a women-owned business. Remember, at one point in time with women-owned businesses, you know, uh, you know, there was this, oh, well, you know, she's going from the kitchen to to the boardroom. How's that going to happen? You know, where are you going to get that experience? You know, and everything else like that. And it's even just in recently, when you look at it, you know, um, you know, they weren't even going into engineering. You know, now it's like fifty percent or more than that. And uh, David. You know, yeah. And 2020 has shown us that everybody goes from the kitchen to the boardroom. So they <laughs> stole, everybody stole the woman's model. <laughs> it's true, true. That's the, that's diversity for you. But yeah, but the, I mean, when you look at it from that perspective of the unconscious biases, we do all have them you know, at the very end of the day. But once you start putting in a program and you say, you know what, I'm going to challenge procurement, you know, at an operational level, say, you know what, we have targets, we have, uh, we, we're giving you support, you know, we're giving you, you know, trying to move this from the corner of your desk to really, an, you know, as an operative, um, you know, mandate or, or an imperative, uh, then that becomes very interesting in terms of, you know, uh, supplier inclusion. Because I, I think at the very, in a very long winded way, um, you know, biases upset the ability for you know Canada to become a real civil society, you know that has inclusion and and um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, you know bringing some sort of equity because they marginalize people, they put them in boxes and so on and so forth, which is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to let all people live to their their, their full potential, whether it's an employee or 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 a supplier. So the one thing I would add, Salima, because David is, is very eloquent on the topic, so I don't, I don't think I would add that. Much, but the one thing I would add is from a neurologic perspective, we, mm -hmm. we absorb 11 million bits of information, whether it's, it's the image that we see, whether it's, it's the plant in the corner when we get in a room, whether it's the color of someone uh, when we get in the room. And so we need, uh, as a way of processing all that information, ways to discriminate the information. And so that discrimination 
prior to us being aware of those differences being okay was perceived as not being okay. If you're different, then it's a threat to who my, my species, if you will. So it's, it's a very uh, basic reaction. And, and I think what we're doing today and what we've been doing mm -hmm. in the past few years, I would say, is to just increase that awareness that when it's different, it it's, doesn't mean that it's a threat, that it should be something bad. To the contrary, it really nourishes the conversation and the output that as a group we, we get to create together. Mm. So, you know, we talk about, uh, we've talked about the bias and, and unconscious bias. So what would you think is the most common misconception in an organization's thinking about diversity? I'm not sure I would I would ask the, that the question that way okay. because I don't think people don't want diversity. I think people sometimes are not aware that they have to take a concrete action to create the diversity because we're in a place where you know we and I'm going to be very um I'm going to make generalization here. You know, we started where in corporate organization, we had male, uh, white male of 50 years old, and that was just the way to do it. And it's only when we realized that this was the picture and that perhaps another picture would be as good or perhaps even better than we decided that we wanted to create that different picture. So it's not that we don't want it. It's we need to be aware that we need to make a specific action to put some energy behind it. I, that's what I would say here. Yeah. yeah. I think from one perspective is uh, you, you do what you know, you know, at the very end of the day. And, it's, and that's one of the biggest challenges in procurement. Um, you're used to dealing with the same people. You know, you trust them. You do business, you know, fundamentally, you do business with people you like, you know, who you trust. You know, um, you know, uh, can you work with them? And, you know, and in some cases, do they share the same values? Um, so I, I think when you're trying to bring in new entrants or new people into that's very hard to break, you know, at the very end of the day. So if you if you compound unconscious biases with habitual uh, ways of, um, you know, uh, uh, doing business, uh, it's very, very hard to break. I'll give you a case on a point. We we once did uh, a project with, uh, uh, believe it or not, it was the Bank of Canada, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, the Bank of Canada wanted to bring more diversity. And, you know, can they kind of looked around their table and they found, uh, you know, um, we, we have a lot of, you know, white old guys that came from Queen's University and so on and so forth. And then we're asking uh, them, well, where do you recruit from? Oh, we recruit from Queens, you know, so, and that's where we trust. And then we're saying, well, you're not going to get very much diversity on around the, you know, around the organization if you just keep doing that. Uh, so in, in many ways, uh, some companies, what they'll do is that they will force their, their supply chain to basically roll over you know, and, and get new suppliers in and so on and so forth. Some contracts have been, some people have held contracts for 10, 10 years, you know, or something like that. They say, well, no, I want a new supplier at the very end of the day, or at least new bids, you know. So um, so that's one way of, a, of breaking the cycle of doing what you know all the time uh, at the very end of the day. And then, and I use the word values, because at the end of the day, and, you know, when I was uh, listening to Bernard, you know, looking around the table, what they're what you're doing is you're trying to introduce new values, you know, within the organization by turning around and saying, you know what, uh, women-owned businesses is a priority for us. Indigenous businesses are a priority for us, you know, and uh, all the rest of this kind of stuff. Now you got to, you know, and we're going to measure it, you know, we're going to measure the spend and we're going to measure how you're introducing and including um, yeah. Where it becomes a challenge for 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 let's say the CAEs or the bigger you know first tier suppliers or the Rolls Royces of your business, you know um, you're going to have things like uh, you know safety, you know the ability to deliver, you know so so forth. And you look at all the indigenous suppliers that are out there, you know a lot of the eighty percent are less than five, you know five employees, and we're mainly a service based industry, you know so and you're a manufacturing well how. How, how do you create that ecosystem that that you know that not only 
he lets us continue with our values, but also make sure that we're delivering because we have to deliver simulators, you know, and and work on these huge projects, you know, uh, in, yeah. in terms of that. So that, that really is a nice challenge. And David, I think you're making me think as well of the impact of getting certified and working with the top tier uh, organization is that it forces you to step up your game as well as a supplier because you want to be able to provide a quality service to those organizations. So the beauty of it is that when you make a commitment, kind of a statement, a declaration that, yes, this is who we are, we're a woman owned or we're, you know, we're able to provide that service, you do everything in your power to be able to provide that service. So it's it's beneficial on both sides, I would say, for that perspective, yeah. Oh, I fully agree with you, Chloe. <laughs> I fully agree with you, because it, it, it really ups the game of, you know, the yeah. of, of the diversity supply chain as well. That's right. Uh, That's right. The, but the other challenges, you know, especially in these high tech ones, and this is where I think the, the, the thing about putting downward pressure on your uh, supply chain, you know, on the second and third tier, you know, level, because uh, you you can right size where the opportunity is for for the diversity supplier, you know, because maybe you know they're not the first tier level, you know, they might be in the second or third tier level. So you look you look for those opportunities, and this is where you kind of roll down your, um, you know, uh, you know those things about. Uh, what is our scorecard in terms of diversity inclusion on the supply chain? Um, you know, and I, I think Bernard had said it. You know, they're 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 kind of basically uh, put into their their RFPs. You know, what is your what is your uh, approach to DNI? You know, in terms of employee development and also in terms of what your supplier development is. So that's a very good way of thinking about it. How do you roll it back up into the scorecard that CAE can point to? You know, um, uh, that they they are meeting the mandates that governments had set out. You know, mm -hmm. so that's where the where the challenge is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how do you think we can start influencing corporate culture on this? Chloe, go ahead, Chloe. I'm sitting on my hands, but I want to hear this. We're doing it today. Like this is a good example of what we're doing. I mean, the all these initiatives are really, really important. First of all, increase awareness, have those conversations, get people to think about. David talked about measurement. Like, in order to measure where we've gone, like the the the, the journey that we've been on, we need to know what's the baseline. So just for people to understand where they start. Even if if it's not a perfect score, nobody has a perfect score, but where are we now? And what can we do in small increments that could get us at a higher rating, if you will, to, just for the sake of giving ourselves a grade? Um, I think that's that's a great way to start. The second thing is, like anything else, it needs to start at the top. It really does need to start at the top. So executive team, need to be a representation of what we want to see in the world, which is a diverse world. So if if we can start whatever the size of the organization with an executive team that is a good representation of what we have in the world, I think then we have a really increased chance to create that within the organization. And then we need to equip all the leaders within an organization to think differently, to lead differently. You know, we used to lead where it was very autocratic, very directive. You know, the boss knew what was the answer. They gave the answer. They gave the, the sense of direction and people needed to follow. We go back not too far ago, unfortunately, in terms of that style of leadership. Now we know that's not the right style of leadership, but leaders are not necessarily fully equipped to really deeply listen, to ask really powerful questions that can get people to increase their awareness, make decisions at their level, to really empower them to make those decisions so that we can create a diverse and inclusion inclusive environment so for me those are the three steps that we absolutely need to think to take david do you have anything to add to that 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I, everything I agree with uh, what Chloe said, but I would layer on the thing about it is the you have to be honest with yourself as an organization, you know. So I always turn around and say that you know you have to look the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, mm. in terms of being able to to relook and and That's it's right across. Sorry, go ahead, go, Chloe. That's the baseline. Is yeah. where, where are we? Yeah. 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 And you have you have to look at that. And be honest with yourself, because sometimes when I talk to, to leadership, you know, and, you know, and you look at the, and you know, their scorecard is bad, you know, you know that they're, and they'll turn around and they'll say, oh, we're doing fantastic. And we're doing all the rest of this kind of great stuff. And I'd say, yeah, that you know, it's true. But, you know, you, you, there's zero spend, you know, uh, uh, and in some of these, the, it's like an industry thing, right? That at the very end of the day, uh, yeah, I don't have to look very far in the indigenous front. You know, I look at utilities or I look at oil and gas, oil and gas. No, I, I don't throw any shade on those guys. They're doing some really good stuff. Uh, but if I look at some other, other industries, you know, um, you know, the, their scorecard, they don't even want to measure their scorecard or measure their, their outputs because they're, they're afraid to see what the lack of engagement. But, uh, and I say that's bad. I think that's a sign of weakness at the very end of the day. So, you know, being able to, uh, you know, with the unwillingness to measure. Um, but, you know, to, to add a little bit more of what Chloe, uh, you know, is saying is that you don't have to do it alone, you know? And this is where, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, people make that fatal mistake within within and it accompanies within an industry. Uh, they don't reach out. They don't reach out to the campsies of the world or they don't reach out to the CCABs or, or you know, or even the, the Weebies enough, you know, at the very end of the day. Um, and the other thing about it is one of the things I'm really encouraging uh, industry to do, uh, especially in aerospace, um, is to really co-develop co-develop with these organizations, uh, co-develop with, um, you know, uh, with uh, the supplier groups. Um, and don't be even afraid to co-develop with, with a supplier that you have in your, in your chain, especially uh, if they're a diverse supplier, because they'll tell you what the, the, the good and the bad and the ugly is at the very end of the day. Uh, you know, and that information is gold for, uh, for, for, for procurement, you know. Hmm. So you talk about co-develop uh, and co-developing. So do you think that there are opportunities for joint ventures or partnerships between diverse suppliers? And if so, how? How do we do this? Mm. Uh, the short answer is yeah. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> absolutely. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is uh, I was posing this question to CAMSI and, and some of the Indigenous organizations, uh, and I said, you know, you really should partner between organizations because at the end of the day from the indigenous uh, standpoint um what we have was we have land and we have people you know so as i said we're the fastest growing population but not only that we're, a lot of indigenous communities and i'll i'll take an example here, uh, Gunawage and Ganasatage, they really think about industrial parks because they're really looking at youth employment. They're really looking at these opportunities. So uh, I was there, you know, if I look at some of the, you know, the suppliers, let's say like uh, uh, CAMSI has uh, Flexingate, they're a minority supplier, very huge. They're very really much in the auto, automotive industry. Um, you know, a, an indigenous community can, you know, uh, with a band council resolution, build a plant on reserve, loan you uh, the, the, uh, through a band council resolution, uh, land for five for five years with one dollar a year, provided you build a plant and you do all the rest of this kind of stuff, um, and you know, uh, and start building capacity within our community for youth, um, you know, and provide those particular jobs. Um, they, they'll do it because that's that is that's our cultural value. So when you look at it from that business case and then let's let's push this a little bit further down the road you know uh and flexigate makes like you know uh what they call rubber hosing and stuff like that that goes right into the automotive industry you know so not only that product has now become uh, a minority product but it becomes an indigenous product because it was created on reserve by indigenous people you know and those are the joint venture opportunities and that's like a you know a big business case for let's say for a prime you know who's who's looking to get diversity spent but also the socioeconomic impact as well you know you, you can't get any better than that than creating jobs on reserve you know and, you know and creating youth capacity building and not only that but also those diversity dollars to joint venture I, that was just a, a case i can give to you right off the top of my head but i think those that there's huge opportunities along those lines 
And I just want to add one more thought along those lines. Um, even with, uh, you know, from the minority supplier side of it, so they have capacity, you know, in terms of being able, some of them have certifications, so on and so forth, that an Indigenous company would be looking for to be included in that. So uh, if I was CAE King for a day, you know, I would be looking at saying, okay, how do I uh, create that ecosystem where I can get the maximum value, especially around ITBs and stuff like that, you know, that uh, industrial technical benefits, you know, where there there is downward pressure in terms of supplier development and capacity building and stuff like that around the pillars. Uh, Salima, the only thing I would add to that is absolutely we need to support each other and be a leverage to one another and, and find opportunities to create uh, something even bigger in terms of offer so that also we we offer, um, a, we, we just have a better offer. Um, mm -hmm. The way we do it, I think that's the challenge. So we, as a supplier, you need to be out there and you're working and you, so you've got to be strategic in terms of where do you put yourself out there so that it gives you the best opportunity to create those, those opportunity. Um, yeah, that's the one thing I would say. Strategic is actually the key word. You have to be strategic. Yeah, you have in to be strategic. Absolutely. Because you know what? And, and I talk about it a lot about leadership, but our first mission really at O2 Coaching is to impact the economy. Firstly, the economy here in Quebec, but then in Canada, and now we're international. So I don't know how much we impact the economy internationally at this stage, but still, you, you know what I mean in terms of that's the... That's the impact. We want to create a strong economy. And we work with CAE. We work with really important with all the banks here in, in Canada. And we know that as we support leaders in those organizations, we support the economy as well. And, and as a supplier, we need to think in that fashion. And so what is the best lever to create that impact, whether it's a JV or whether it's working in co-partnership with clients, like all my clients are partners, all of them, and we co-create uh, programs, for example, or we co-create a vision of what they want to create in terms of their culture. And, and that is really the key to having the impact you want to have. Chloe, you mentioned, uh, and we all know that you you have experience uh, at an international level. Um, can you share with us what is what has been your experience with diversity and inclusion at the international level? Is it as important elsewhere as it is in North America? That's a very good question because now, as I'm looking at my groups, they're all international groups that are joined by one company or one group so i for example i won't i won't be able to tell you that company in europe does this or they're really concerned but my my first incline would be to say yeah they're as concerned about that and perhaps they are even more concerned about that because they some of those countries for examples in europe they are so close to one another they're already conscious of the differences um different cultures and and different perspectives we'll call it that so i would say they're as keen as having an impact on diversity as as north america from my experience now i don't have the data behind that yeah have you uh, seen any initiatives on dni uh in other countries that uh, could be interesting for us to look at here so, so I'll tell you what I, what I'm involved in. Okay, so I'm involved with the A effect, which I know uh, CAE is also part of. So the A effect is a, a program where women, and you have your own program as well uh, within CAE, which is there that is there to support women uh, growth professionally. And so they have women from everywhere in the world in that program. So they are part of those types of initiatives. Uh, but more than that, let me th let me think. I'll see if I have a, a, an additional example that nothing yeah. comes to mind at this point. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, in I, your experience, oh, please. No, no, no. Exactly. I was getting, I was just going to add to it. I can give the indigenous perspective. <laughs> the, uh, the, I think within the indigenous community globally, we're a little bit more organized in a way, and, and because a because of the Commonwealth, that's one part of it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also the proximity of the United States, and they also the fact is that 
Canada exported the Indian Act. So a lot of these countries basically picked up a lot of stuff and they're kind of suffering the same kind of uh, ill effect that we have because of the Indian Act. Um, but the other thing that happened was the indigenous communities globally kind of banded together and started sharing experiences and, and so on and so forth. So other countries like New Zealand, Australia, uh, in the United States, I think uh, South America started to pick up a little bit on terms of what they're looking at DNI. And we kind of share information between each other. So if I was to rank different countries, like I would say New Zealand is probably the furthest ahead because if you look at their uh, their spend you look at their their inclusion and uh, Australia is sort of getting there but they have a sort of a different cultural aspect um, Canada you know is it's it's super complex uh, because uh, you know when you look at New Zealand and Australia uh, to have DNI or uh, you know indigenous inclusion uh, they only have to deal with a small group maybe three or four languages or so on and so forth Canada is 650 different nations they all have different agreements with the with the federal government and notwithstanding the fact there's like 52 languages you know and not kind of the, you know the dialects um, and different also different priorities. Um, so I, I think that the complexity of, of the question, you know, if I was to look at a model, so okay, I'll take the most complex ecosystem that has to do it and, and see where I can work with, because the rest sort of becomes easy. Um, but at the same, same time, they have all these models that CAE can go to and look at and so on and so forth and see what, what New Zealand's doing, you know, in terms of, uh, and, and it's available because at the end of the day, the federal government has all that data, you know, so, uh, and how to be like tapping there and say, okay, what have you learned, you know? Um, so, uh, so, uh, so short answer to your question on the indigenous front is probably more organized. There's probably a lot of more measurements and stuff like that. Um, also, you know, what we've been able to do, we had to do a work for Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, and we looked at all the different frameworks between all what we call peer countries. So we're able to see where their their priorities are. For example, you know, the United States focuses on the tax system. So you have the Small Business uh, uh, Business Act that they have. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember the number exactly, but it's you know tax credits and and grants and so on and so forth. Where Australia and New Zealand, it's a scorecard. In Canada, it's policy, you know, so all sorts of different things that are along those lines. So there's a lot to learn out of out of that front. And I'm pretty sure it can be ported over to some other the other groups as well, you know, in terms of being able to create that supply inclusion. It won't be exact. We have to deal with the degrees of separation uh, between the challenges because they're not all equal, you know, that kind of thing. And that's the tendency of corporations. They all kind of want to find that magic bullet you know, at the very end of the day, but if there's really no magic bullet. You have to take a look at it from, you know, the sum of its parts in order to come up with a great DNI strategy. But there's models out there and there's stuff out there. And there's data out there, at least on the indigenous front. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I didn't know about New Zealand and Australia as much. So that was uh, very interesting. Thank you, David. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so in your experience, how can, then, how can we then remove economic and social barriers that prevent some of the underrepresented talent from ascending? I, I would say to give equal and fair uh, chances to all of these groups. Bernard was saying, you know, there's a discrepancy in, in the representation of LGBTQ, for example, in organization versus being homeless. There's a, there's a big difference there. Um, so we need to be really conscious and give fair and equal chances. So we need to put in places like many organizations like CAE is definitely doing we need to have a conscious effort to give equal and fair chances to all of these groups. I think maybe just to add what uh, what Chloe has just said, you know, um, one of the things I, I looked at and I was very pleased to see in the first part of the presentation is where you have placing people in the organization. You know, so you're saying, OK, well, you know what, we're going to have DNI within the employee base. You know, mm -hmm. and that changes dynamics. And I'll give you a pure example. One of our uh, interns, one of our first interns that we had, uh, we uh, we put her in with um, Accenture at the time. It wasn't easy to get her there. That we had to really make a business case, you know, and all the rest. And finally, we got her in. Um, but you know, fast forward. This was about eight years ago. Fast forward to today. Uh, she is now the global uh, talent manager for the Americas. 
you know, so, you know, that, that kind of success story. And uh, she comes from Ganawage and she makes more than her husband and she's you know, doing really, really well and stuff like that. Uh, and she kind of looks at this kind of thing. Well, you know what? At the end of the day, if it wasn't the internship program that kind of pushed, you know, that company to, to get me in there and turn around and do that, um, uh, I wouldn't been able to to get to that particular position, you know, at the very end of the day. But once she got in there, uh, she started to create an internship program and she started to look at supplier diversity she started looking at these different things so they start working within and that's that's really key in my opinion in order to have a, a great dni strategy so making sure you do have a good representation of lgbtq women that have a particular voice in the organization uh indigenous suppliers you know not just but indigenous employees you know that are you know permeating all parts of the you know the operation and it's the same case with uh, uh, you know um, with another company we put them into um, uh, you know in, uh, she, they started their internship on the supply chain and again they're they're, they're doing uh, they're, she, he's moved up to global procurement uh, within this organization but he's also started to create these uh, you know indigenous supply uh, supply chain initiatives you know but having that understanding of the community. So. Interesting. So I want to bring it back to certification for a minute. So both of mm -hmm. you are certified with different organizations. So tell us what benefits has certification brought to you and your company? Chloe? For us, it's very simple. It gave us access to uh, tender applications, which we won, uh, which gave us the opportunity to train, for example, uh, 250 leaders of one organization, which you know, had we not be cert certified, we would have not had access to the tender and so forth and so on. And that really created a shift in our business model where we weren't doing so much now smaller training. We are now the provider of major trainings for all leaders of one organization. So it really shifted our business model and it really shifted the the access to major uh, tender or mandates that we didn't have before. And, and I, don't, I don't know if you want to get into that right now, but it's for me, it was a real simple process. You need to put a bit of time. It takes a bit of money, but it's at the end of the day, when you compare the benefits to it, it's a real simple process and we are certified with two organizations, we be and we connect. Um, and we didn't have any issues in terms of, you know, it's very clear what you need to get, to provide uh, on, uh, the, the, the papers you need to give and, and on, until you've got all those papers, you don't apply. And when you've got them, you apply and it's, it's a fairly easy process. So um, access to big mandates, shift in business model, uh, increase in revenue, visibility, credibility. Gee, I'm trying to think if there's a downside. I don't think <laughs> there is. <laughs> yeah. 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 Really, and, I, and I'm joking, but and I said this to, to Sylvia prior to us going online, it changed our lives. O2 coaching prior to being certified is not the same as O2 now. And our mission is to impact a million leaders. And now it's it's really interesting. Now I feel like we we can achieve that. Well, I'm happy to hear that, and I and I do hope, and I'm sure I know you're going to succeed at uh, at getting achieving that goal for sure. <laughs> <laughs> David, what has been your experience uh, on certification? Yeah, uh, everything that Chloe said, but I'll just add to it. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's really it's really hard because, and uh, in, in, in some ways, um, yeah, you have to have a willingness to to be certified. You know, and it depends because we're certified like a, by not just CAMC but CCAB. They have a CAB uh, certified Indigenous business. Um, they also have, uh, you know, the CANDU's developing, and they they will like, and we're going to probably be certified through them as well, uh, or I have been certified. Um, the other uh, thing is also from the government perspective, and they're not all equal, you know, so I'll just put that way, uh, put it out there in the ether. Um, the, it really depends on the 
the organize, you know, like uh, you know, the the prime's view on who they 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 work with at the very end of the day. But some some certifications, like for, and this is why this is the big challenge of being an indigenous business. You know, you got to be certified with all these. Yeah. Put in the paperwork. You got to show 51% ownership at least. You know, uh, you have to bring in your management uh, agreement. Um, and uh, not only that, but also you have to show your indigenous card. You know, your proof of you know uh, you you belong to an indigenous organization. Uh, so that kind of thing. And if you have to do that three or four times over, you know, <laughs> that you know. For an indigenous business that's maybe five people, or when we started, it was two people. That that's quite arduous in a in a way, uh, but necessary. Okay, and I'll put that necessary because at the end of the day, what uh, what happens is, as as Chloe pointed out, it's the credibility side, right? So at the very end of the day, there's no question. You know, someone third party has basically said, yeah, you're an indigenous business. You know, uh, you know, uh, and they kind of tell their their procurement people, yeah, you can buy from. Uh, Acosis, yes, they are CAMC certified, da, 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 you know, all the rest is kind of good stuff. Um, and so now the transaction could happen and, and there's assurances that that spend is going to, you know, an indigenous business, you know, all the rest is kind of good stuff. So I, I think that's where it really becomes key. The challenge is, is because of the number of certifications, I've been encouraging a lot of the organizations to have reciprocating agreements. You know, at the very end of the day, even talking to Indigenous Services Canada, saying, you know, you might want to download a lot of those uh, certification. And this is where uh, it becomes sort of a challenge. One of the biggest things with Indigenous people, OK, because of the Indian Act, the Indian Act had two principles. One is determining who can be Native or Indigenous because they control, you know, that kind of viewpoint. Um, and also the way they govern themselves. Those are two principles of the Indian Act. So just, he, uh, you know, the uh, ISC turn around to determining you're an Indigenous business and you're not an Indigenous business, you know, that kind of thing runs very sour in our blood, you know, uh, for, you know, that for obvious reasons. But, you know, the fact that they want the willingness to devolve it and put it into an indigenous organizations to turn around and make that determination whether this business is, you know, valid indigenous business or versus another one. It, it's, it speaks volumes in terms of that. And the fact that industry service recognizes those indigenous organizations is uh, very powerful and very important. Because now you've you you basically um, uh, put this, you know, starting to break the Indian Act, you know, in a way. And the Indian Act is one of the ra most racist documents that Canada's ever produced, you know, uh, that's still in existence and still being applied, uh, that kind of thing. But just by that, just looking at membership and, 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 and pushing down into Indigenous organizations breaks that cycle. That, and that's how powerful certification is and who, who gives it, you know, so uh, uh, very long wouldn't exp explanation, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but those are realities of it uh, that I see. Salima, the one thing I would add here is that although the process is very easy, the one thing pe some suppliers should not think is that once you get the certification, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> obviously, obviously, there's work in in reaching out. There's work in making sure that you're being seen. There's work. But you would have to do that regardless. It's just that now you have a channel to do yeah. it that supports you being seen by the right organizations and the right people. But you still have to do a bit of work to uh, promote. No, yourself. no. As, as Chloe turned around, it, the certification that gets you is a ticket to the dance. You know, at the end of the day, yeah, you got to dance. You know, that kind of thing. And you got to dance put, well. I mean, yeah. you got to have a, a nice product and a nice service. And, yeah. and you got to, yeah. You've got yeah. to offer something that is really good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. And to your earlier point, Chloe, you know, you got to up your game, especially, you know, uh, and I turn around and tell my employees to say, hey, man, you guys want to play in the big leagues? You know, we have to be, you know, That's we right. have to be, you know, swinging pretty hard at the yeah. at the bat and stuff like that. You know, that kind of thing, because there, there's a lot of competition, even among diverse, which is good, which is good. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah. And um 
So yeah, so it's all about what your product and services is, you know, your delivery time, are you bringing the best value for money and that kind of thing. Uh, being a small business, you know, at the end of the day, believe it or not, your drop of water, CAE, is a reservoir for us, <laughs> you know? So, you know, so when you look at it from, from that kind of social impact, it, it means a lot. You know, as you know, being uh, brings a lot of value as a certified business. Uh, and, at the and, very you end of and you mentioned, David, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Yeah, but sorry. You, got, you got me passionate here. You, <laughs> it's a, the, 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 the drop is an ocean mm -hmm. and you support smaller systems mm -hmm. because I hire five, um, six amazing women and they themselves have their families. So when you support O2 coaching, you support all of those people and and if i support diversity and inclusion then the ripple effect is endless really yeah yeah, yeah. and you look at the the procurement dollars that that uh, that you provide at the very end of the day you know when you look from a community's perspective you know uh from the indigenous community side the biggest challenge for us was to get money coming into the community you know and they say that once you put that dollar into the community you know, um, it rattles around seven times before it exits, you know, and that's what the very end of the day supplier diversity does. It, it makes those dollars rattle around. The biggest challenge for the past, I would say for the past time memorial, I think it's only started to change in the past maybe 10 years or so, um, was a lot of the dollars going into was leaving the community that were not included because of the lack of inclusion, uh, were not being uh, poured it into. So when the government spent hit the indigenous community and had primes working on it and so on and so forth, um, they uh, the dollars went to a lot of non-indigenous businesses and so on and so forth. So the dollars never really had that socio-economic effect that what government wanted at the very the end of the day when they built their first industrial technical benefits programs. They had to really force industry to have a indigenous benefit plans or indigenous participation components because they want to make that money hit the community and uh, at the end of the day. And the biggest misnomer of, or the biggest misunderstanding of a uh, non-Indigenous front is the fact that, you know, um, you know uh, the Canadian public doesn't really understand the Indigenous community. They think, you know, 80, they think we all live in the bush, you know, at the very end of the day, but we don't, you know, we're 60% of the Indigenous communities are around an urban centre. And it's notwithstanding the fact there's a lot of Indigenous people running around. There's 40,000 of us running around Montreal, the island of Montreal here. And how many times I've been mistaken as a very tall Filipino, you know, but not really an Indigenous person, unless I wear my, you know, bolos and stuff like that at the very end of the day. But that's really, you know, with the breaking down of, you know, of, of biases and targets and, uh, getting the right people into that so they can identify uh, and understand the challenges and so on and so forth uh, to, to bring that uh, diversity inclusion. Absolutely. And uh, yes, the biases are there. And yes, I absolutely agree with both of you that certification brings credibility. I think that's key mm -hmm. uh, in advancing in your business. So I have one last question for both of you. Um, we have a lot of suppliers that, you know, from different levels of business uh, range, you know, so uh, we've com big companies and the smaller companies. So what would you recommend as a first step um, for a company to take uh, who is looking to promote diversity and inclusion in their workplace? David, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a really good question. And um, I, I think the first step is, you know, uh, CAE is king. You're the biggest buyer, you know, that kind of thing. So at the end of the day, if you don't put downward pressure uh, along the second and third tier line, there's no real business case for an indigenous, for, uh, you know, a, a larger prime, a larger uh, company to do business with a smaller company. So you, you need to do that. That's, I think that's one of the big things. Um, but it's also, and, and I'm not saying, uh, you know, and it's very easy to do. I mean, you could put that into your RFP and you're already doing that from my understanding, from what I, I heard. Uh, so then what happens is the, the creative forces take place. And this is where I'm going to put pressure. If there's campsies on the line or any other, other ones, uh, you know, where they have to, uh, you know, in, include uh, when they, they do their reach out to include uh, your supply chain. You know, because that's where the matchmaking happens. As I, I'll fundamentally say this, you do business with people you like, 
people who share, you know, share the same values, people you can work with, people you trust. And that happens when you, you, you have your organizations, you have your supplier days and so on and so forth to really kind of uh, work and build that trust between uh, within the supply chain. So not only that CAs created the business case, but the organizations created the ecosystem for, uh, you know, you know, joint ventures and and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Um, I think at the end of the day, you, you, you'll get those, uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll get more diversity within the supply chain and doing business with each other. And, uh, you know, just to give you a point, case in point, uh, we have a joint venture with PwC, you know, <laughs> because PwC uh, wanted access to to market. They made a bit good business case uh, that, and we needed their capability because they had project references that we needed at the very end of the day. And, you know, we're doing we're doing great business with government because because uh, they have a set aside program and they have other things that are out there that increase. Um, and we also have a new uh, we actually helped another company, um, you know, in a joint venture because they used to have an indigenous partner. Unfortunately, the indigenous partner uh, disappeared. Uh, so they needed to and they had contracts that they needed to fulfill. And so they asked us to step in. Um, you know, um, because uh, you know, to and doing a joint venture, and we helped them protect their market. So that was a that was a you know a, a pretty good deal. So those kind of little things happen, but they go a long way for you know, especially if a business is five people or twenty people or you know forty people at the very end of the day. You know, when you look at it, so those are the little things, that, the opportunities I look for if I was uh, king for a day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to be queen for a day, maybe. For me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be that. Okay. Chloe, yeah. <laughs> let's address the uh, maybe the second and third tier level suppliers. Uh, how could they start promoting a diversity and inclusion in the workplace? I think they need to have a baseline as to internally and externally how are they doing. First off, and then give us give themselves objectives that are realistic. And then internally start hiring from the diversity and from an external perspective, making sure that in their supply chain, there is that little box where they ask, are you from diversity? And if they get the choice to, to choose a supplier that has the same level of service, but that comes from diversity, they should start, they should start there. And then measure it. So make a baseline, give yourself objectives, hire and, and hire internally and externally, and then measure it, measure it. Are we increasing and, and celebrate your success? So celebrate it and, and see the value that it's bringing you to be a diverse organization an inclusive organization. If Thank I just you. add one more thing that I forgot to mention is very important, I mm -hmm. think, one of the biggest thing for diversity and inclusion, especially on the supply chain, and is education. <laughs> you know, <laughs> cultural education. And I just I was been on with one of the CAE opening up and understanding indigenous businesses. A lot of it was prompted because of the the children that were found, uh, and that they're still finding these days on unmarked graves. That prompted a lot. That it moved me. The fact that CAE jumped on this and said, "No, we want to make sure that this 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 is a priority for us." Education is very key, and one of the, we did a study with uh, for Indigenous Services Canada and PSPC or Public Works, and to trying to benchmark how much understanding procurement has uh, and what are they missing, and it, they were really missing a lot of tools around uh, diversity and inclusion. You know, on how to do that, what methods, what what are the opportunities are. They had a great understanding of how to create contracts and RFPs and making sure there's transparency, which is very important, especially if you're doing, uh, you know, in the position you are at, in. Um, those are very, very important things. But these run sometimes against the grain of diversity inclusion because, you know, you, you don't want to create set aside contracts. You don't want to create these things and so on and so forth. So there needs to be more education along the sides of procurement, the people that have to do the work day to day uh, in order to create more of an ecosystem for, for DNI. Thank you. So if I summarize, educate, educate yourselves, work with other organizations that share the same values with you and reach out to the organizations like Hamsi and Weeby who are going to help you uh, in, in just that, in promoting diversity and inclusion. So thank you very much, Chloe and David, for this.
very illuminating conversation. It was so a pleasure to, uh, to have you with us today. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in. We, we will have a question answer period at the end of the, the session today. We'll have some, we'll leave some time for that. Uh, je vois qu'il y a beaucoup de questions qui, qui rentrent. Nous allons les répondre après la prochaine session. Donc, merci de rester avec nous. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Sylvia Pensack is the president and CEO of We Be Canada, a Canadian nonprofit organization certifying women-owned businesses and opening the doors to corporate and government supply chains under supplier diversity across North America. Sylvia has over 20 years of leadership experience in the nonprofit and business environment, leading transformational projects and teams. Her diverse international background spearheading successful initiatives gives her a wealth of experience to lead supplier diversity to its next level to support Canadian women-owned businesses. Welcome, Sylvia. Oh, Sylvia. <laughs> it always happens to there me. You, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for having me, Selena. Uh, I, I do want to say it's such an honor and pleasure to be here in your community and uh, connecting with the suppliers. Fantastic announcement uh, from CAE uh, starting to implement supply diversity measure track and really request uh, the reports uh, from your supply chain. Uh, kudos on that and I will be looking for that uh, membership application from you uh, very shortly. <laughs> no pressure. Um, uh, really Chloe, um, uh, fantastic work. Uh, of, uh, you know, David, like the insights that you put in, like measuring, tracking, so important, so important in this uh, time and age as we are coming out of COVID. And uh, I, I just want to say, you know, it is such a pleasure to be here and representing Canadian certifying councils and be uh, talking to your supply chain, you know, about the importance of certification, supply diversity, and um, uh, what is actually happening in Canadian marketplace. Absolutely. Thank you, Sylvia. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about your organization? Uh, absolutely. So uh, WBE Canada is actually a shortcut for Women Business Enterprises uh, Canada Council. So it's a long name. So we like it as WBE Canada or VB Canada. Um, so we actually opened the doors for Canadian women-owned businesses into large corporate and government supply chains, but we don't do it only one way, we do it both ways. So we actually connect not only suppliers to the buyers, but also buyers to the suppliers. Uh, so um, uh, in um, like before we even dive into supply diversity, if you can um, uh, move the slide to the next uh, uh, to the next slide. I just want to bring uh, your attention, you know, to the statistics um, about women-owned businesses in Canada. And these ones are actually not so positive. So this is what you will hear at news because news likes negative stories. Uh, so you will see like declines, negative impact, hard time. Like this is all truth. But we've also seen some fantastic success stories within our community. We've seen women-owned businesses, and just like Chloe mentioned, you know, scaling up their businesses because they were super innovative and creative and they had access because of certification, you know, to the buyers. We've seen buyers step up their game and really support women-owned businesses in a meaningful way and creating those opportunities within their supply chains. I actually look at COVID and I see it as a fantastic positive experience that I've had with corporations, governments, as well as women-owned businesses who did not disappoint. So I just wanted to bring this to uh, to our audience attention that, you know, not everything you hear on the news is, uh, is fully truth. There's also other side of the coin. So while um, it is it is true that some businesses are struggling, but it is, it is also truth that the supply chains uh, really started to recognize the challenges and they started to transform their approach to how they are purchasing and how they are buying, which has a ripple effect on the communities. So um, uh, what I want to cover today, I, I just want to talk about the opportunities that exist in large supply chains, the missing link uh, to help you land more business in Canada and abroad, and how diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives in supply chains are transforming Canada. So a couple statistics um, that I'm going to throw at you. Uh, so first of all, Canada is still not doing well. 
<laughs> in diversity in supply chains. So we are still way under 5% of diversity spent within corporate and government supply chains, which is sad and heartbreaking. So our neighbors south of the border are doing much better. Their day spent is anywhere between 20 to 30 percent. Um, uh, the U.S. government is looking at increasing their spend yet again. Uh, so um, we are just um, uh, patiently or sometimes impatiently waiting for our government to take a lead. And um, we are celebrating every single corporation and uh, uh, public organization as well that makes a stand just like CAE today. Um, so when it comes to women, um, uh, the spend within corporate and public supply chains is less than 2%. Uh, so I do want to highlight this number because uh, many times I hear in conversations, you know, like women are coming after men's, you know, like contracts and it's not fair. We should be afraid. Well, maybe you should because 98% is what actually does not belong to women right now. And uh, I think women should be much higher, 17% of uh, companies in Canada are uh, women-owned. Um, it, it is pathetic that women, we are not seeing more women in supply chains. Uh, women are there, and I actually do have a statistic, very recent statistic from um, uh, Statistics Canada, uh, which says that uh, women in Canada are actually among the most educated in the world. 65% um, women, uh, 25 to 64, had a college uh, or um, university degree, as opposed to OECD countries, which are seeing 41% women who are educated. So we have educated uh, workforce, we have educated women, we have educated women entrepreneurs. We uh, like they are capable, they are able to deliver. And many times when they get opportunity to access the supply chain, they pleasantly and positively impact, uh, surprise and impact uh, the outcomes. So uh, it is um, overdue, uh, you know, to open those doors. 90% um, growth of supply diversity in Canada. We've seen so many corporations and public entities to step up their game and really start looking at how do we improve uh, our spend? How, we, how do we diversify? How do we become more equitable, more inclusive? Uh, so Canadian uh, certifying councils were very busy <laughs> during pandemic. 300% um, uh, growth in opportunities for Canadian VBs. We've seen it in Canada internationally in the US, we are seeing companies are really stepping up the game uh, and uh, stepping into the gap that exists in supply chains. Uh, so very positive notes. Um, on, on the other side, I do want to talk about the opportunities. So there's a lot of opportunities that are opening up. So uh, CAE is just one of many large corporations in here. And every single one of these large corporations presents a fantastic opportunity for women-owned businesses. But as uh, Salima and Bernard already mentioned, you know, like when they start looking at their tier ones, tier twos, and how they are impacting and how they are buying that opportunity will start growing and scaling up for diverse businesses. And we are going to see more and more opportunities happening within Canada and internationally as well. Uh, so again, while well, we are seeing uh, like a really small number of corporations in Canada, in the US, 95% of Fortune 500 companies already have supplier diversity program. Some are better functional than the others, but um, this is just uh, a reality. But many of those programs are actually open uh, to Canadian suppliers. So when you um, actually get your certification, the doors will open not only to Canadian uh, corporations, but also to international global companies, uh, because your certification will be recognized under their supplier diversity programs. Um, and again, uh, there were significant supply chains. I am happy to hear those conversations that are happening. You know, maybe we made a mistake, right? Like running our companies around, like buying from China and uh, not even looking at how we are supporting domestic markets. So when we are restarting economy, it will not be simple, but it can actually be done right. When we look at how can we impact local economies, how can we support and buy Canadian? And um, of course, not everything will be able to be purchased in here, but uh, I think it was David who mentioned, you know, like 
um, maybe Canadian company will not be tier one, but maybe that tier two, tier three opportunity will really help scale up that Canadian business uh, that can uh, eventually become a global company. Uh, corporations and the governments are eager to make meaningful impact. And actually, I do have, um, you know, an insight. Uh, VB Canada launched um, a survey and released a study uh, this September uh, called the Status of Supply Diversity Programs in Canada uh, in September. And um, uh, one of the findings that we found was that uh, majority of the organizations in Canada are actually doing supply diversity because of the social impact and social reasons, which was shocking. And I think we have a lot of work to do to actually tie supplier diversity into business outcomes and business benefits, uh, because that's what supplier diversity actually is. And that brings me to the next slide, because I actually have a, a definition that supplier diversity is a business strategy. It is not a social assistance program, which is, I think, um, the biggest lesson I, I can say to larger suppliers who are going to be like, well, I don't know if I want to implement supplier diversity. I, I have so much on my to-do list, like why, what is this new initiative? And they like nobody likes new projects and ideas until you understand that this is a solid business strategy. Because if you're um, uh, if your supply chain is diverse and diversified, you will be able to see different price points, different innovations, different uh, opinions and different approaches. And it will actually uh, speed up the innovation within your own company. It, uh, it might bring some cost savings, some time savings. It might bring some great ideas. And one of the biggest benefits that I like the most about supply and diversity is on the employee side, because the moment your employees find out that you care about diversity and especially in a supply chain, they stick with your company. Young people will want to work in your company because you are known uh, to be a company that cares about diversity. So people like to do business with companies that uh, look like them and sound like them. And if you continue being non-diverse, I am pretty sure that there comes a time and day in our Canadian economy system where diverse clients will start leaving and they will stop buying from you. So this is just my warning, fair warning. We are not there yet, but it can happen fairly quickly. Um, OK, so let's talk about what supplier diversity is not. So um, I think Chloe already mentioned it that um, uh, and David echoed it, you know, supply and diversity is not a guarantee. So certification process is actually uh, fairly easy, simple. If you have your paperwork in order and if you are eligible, if uh, it's pretty complex if you are not eligible because you might not be able to game the system. But if you are eligible and you get in, it's not a guarantee. No corporation will, or government will give you contract just because you have that certificate in hand. So you actually need to deliver on quality, on cost, uh, meet the service requirement. You still need to be a good supplier. You still need to compete and win uh, the gig. So you still need the same marketing, sales strategies, customer support strategies. You still need to have a quality product or service in order to win. So the only reason why Chloe and David were able to succeed through their certification was not because of certification. A certification opened the doors, but it was because of the, the quality of their programs and services that they are delivering. So I just wanted to drive that because many people think, oh, I can do a crappy job, but they have to keep me because I'm nervous. This is not going to happen. It is not a social assistance program for that. You can go, you know, to ask for EI and go to government programs, but not to corporations for sure. Uh, it is not promise of securing business. You still need to respond to those RFPs, build your connections, develop them, and it is not a guarantee. Um, so again, you still need to continue developing those relationships, regular business strategies, 
apply. And that is a very important thing that you need to know about supply diversity. So even when you are a tier one supplier who is looking at developing supply diversity program, it does not mean that you will have to now start working with crappy suppliers. No, you will actually have access to some incredible suppliers. That is what's going to happen. You just did not have visibility to them uh, at this point. So um, I, I do want to talk about the qualification criteria for the uh, supplier diversity and for the certification so that everybody knows what, what in the world are we talking about. So under supplier diversity, uh, you can only qualify if you are a for-profit enterprise. So we don't accept applications from nonprofit organizations uh, or individuals. You have to be uh, legally uh, established for profit business. Uh, you need to be headquartered in Canada or owned by a Canadian citizen or permanent resident or both. Uh, so in VB Canada, we actually uh, found a loophole uh, in certification for women owned businesses. Uh, so um, if uh, women owned businesses were um, uh, were headquartered in the US, but uh, founded by a Canadian citizen, they were unable to get certified anywhere. So uh, VBank in the US only certifies uh, businesses owned by US citizens. Um, so they were unable to certify Canadian owned uh, businesses. So we stepped in and we decided that if you are a Canadian citizen, even if you own a business outside of the country, we will still certify you uh, because you are a Canadian citizen. You must be 51% or more owned, managed and controlled by women or other diverse groups. So women for VB Canada. And I am going to give you, um, you know, an overview of the uh, councils, um, Canadian councils that exist here and who certify each group. Uh, so for women owned businesses, it's VB Canada, WB Canada. Uh, and I believe I sent, uh, um, I sent the links to the team so they can post it in a chat. Uh, Aboriginal visible minorities are certified by CAMSI. Uh, as, uh, Canadian Aboriginal Minority Supply Chain uh, Council. Uh, uh, LGBTQ2 plus uh, uh, certified by CGLCC, Canadian uh, Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, people with disabilities and veterans get certified by IWSCC, Inclusive Workplace and Supply Chain Council. And uh, as uh, David mentioned, there's also CCAB, uh, Canadian Chamber of uh, uh, Aboriginal Businesses. Uh, so all of these councils are Canadian. They certify Canadian uh, businesses, uh, depending on which uh, category uh, or uh, you meet or uh, which criteria you meet, you go to that council. And we uh, follow similar procedures. 51% ownership management control is the criteria. Uh, in VB Canada, we also check that your taxes are up to date. If uh, you uh, miss your taxes, uh, that might be criteria for this certification. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, you need to be selling to or through uh, large corporations or governments. Uh, so if you are planning to do online sales, you know, on Etsy or somewhere eBay, like uh, I don't know if eBay still exists. <laughs> Amazon, uh, then you don't need a certification. But if you want to work with large corporations or government, certification is definitely something you should consider. And you heard it today, CIE is going to look for certification. So if you want to do business with a CIE, certification can absolutely help you to get into that diversity spend reporting. And then, um, so I consider certification a missing link. Um, I uh, personally feel that uh, certification can have a huge and fantastic benefits. And uh, VB Canada pu published um, uh, published a report uh, back in uh, June, uh, June 2021. It was on the status of VB certification um, in Canada, and we were asking our VB suppliers, what are the top reasons why you get certified and what uh, certification helps you with. And uh, some of the top three um, reasons were actually um, 
getting access to the corporations, um, increasing the sales and improving marketing and learning how to uh, how to approach RFPs and win more contracts. So women of businesses are hungry <laughs> to have more contracts and have better opportunities, which is exciting thing uh, to hear. Uh, so uh, I already introduced VB Canada, but I want to share a link uh, to certification if you are interested in getting certified with uh, VB Canada. So maybe go to the next slide. Uh, so if you go to vbcanada.ca slash certification, you will be able to read uh, about the criteria, apply, and we also have something called certification manual or policy where you can read everything about um, how we qualify suppliers, how we process the applications, and what criteria you have to meet. Uh, so that would be in a nutshell, uh, you know, the overview of the supply diversity certification councils in Canada. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, on, on these topics. Uh, but maybe just a final note. Um, it is so important as uh, Canada is coming out of this pandemic to look at diversity, inclusion and equity, not only uh, within the workforce, uh, we've seen huge benefits of um, of DNI initiatives internally within the corporations. But I do believe it is time to expand these initiatives from internal to external and really start supporting diverse businesses and creating opportunities for them. Uh, I've seen uh, personally where you know everybody wins when uh, when supplier diversity program works. It's the company that benefits. It's the uh, business, uh, diverse business that benefits, and absolutely, it is the community that benefits because I think it was Chloe who mentioned like the ripple effect, you know, across the community, across uh, across Canada, uh, and this is what I want to see. That's my personal desire to see as we are coming out of this pandemic. I really hope we learn the lesson and we are going to support our own because our own will paid back and they will support our own and we will invest into our children and into our grandchildren and uh, we will all reap the rewards if we do that. Absolutely. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, you, you touched on, I think, all the key points or some of the questions that uh, we're getting from the audience. So thank you very much for that. Um, I just have a quick question. What are some of the challenges that uh, companies have faced that you've seen and how have they overcome them? especially in the process of certification? Um, some of the challenges in the certification process mm -hmm. or in the selling to corporations? On certification, I think some of the, some of the questions or challenges that we've, that we've seen. That you've seen. So, so some certifications are fairly easy. Um, so some certification are super simple. If you are like 100% owner, you know, or 51% owner, like you run your company, you know about your company, there are no challenges, right? So we are only, as certifying councils, we are looking to make sure that only the the right businesses will get access to these opportunities. So you, you see these activities listed, right? Like it just, there's so much that certification offers like development access promotion right like we really we provide access to the corporations access to the buyer so we want to make sure that only the diverse businesses that are eligible have access to that we want to make sure that when companies like cae actually report they spend with diverse communities they see they count the right companies not somebody who just self uh you know self proclaim themselves that we have women owned like well there's no checks and balances in that and there can be fraud right and um maybe the opportunity there is like I like to say it this way, business owners are smart. If they see a window of opportunity, they will take it on. So you need to have those checks and balances in place like certification in order to verify that the right businesses are coming in. If um, uh, if you are coming to, uh, to like fool us and to do the fraud, you are most likely going to get caught because we know what to check for. We know how to verify paper versus reality. Uh, so our process actually includes uh, at VB Canada, we have three step process. We do review the paperwork, 
then we conduct a site visit to ensure that the reality matches the paperwork. Um, Pre-COVID, we were going into manufacturing facilities. Right now, we are doing everything via Zoom. So you take us with your phone, uh, right, camera across your facility. We do, um, uh, we do talk to your people. We do uh, review the processes, you know, how you come with your product. And then uh, at the end, we do have certification committee, which is comprised of our corporations, corporate representatives. They compile all the information our team collected and then they dissect the information and decide uh, is the company eligible or not? Are there any, you know, like any shady things happening in the company? And um, if yes, uh, they just don't get uh, certified. So even uh, there is also a fee included. I do have to mention that certification is not free. Um, uh, so even though we have that fee to prevent the fraud and prevent companies from applying when they are not eligible, we are still seeing that about five to 7% uh, of companies uh, do not certify because they don't meet the criteria. So my personal recommendation would be, if you are 100% owned, it's fairly easy, it's simple, you know, you will qualify. If uh, there are percentages, if your share structure is very complicated, if you have holding companies involved, we are looking into each of them. So maybe get legal involved and make sure that uh, they are reviewed the criteria before you apply. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Um, yeah, definitely uh, important uh, to make sure we don't have any fraud. And I just want to mention that, yes, there is a fee, but the benefits definitely outweigh the little cost you're going to pay to get certified. So Absolutely. Okay. And, the, and the fee is not that crazy. It differs, you know, like every council has different fee based on the services and uh, support they provide to their customers with VB Canada. Uh, we started in 2009 and we introduced the fee $750. And we never change the fee. So we don't increase it, even though like the costing of everything increases. VB Canada is staying the same. Um, so our women of businesses are telling us that, you know what, the fee is much less than the marketing it would cost me, you know, like to get to the buyers that I'm accessing. So um, we actually uh, see that many of our events, if you attend matchmakers and networking events, you know, they can actually cut down uh, the time of your networking by six months at least. Um, so many times it really shows off uh, years out of your sales uh, strategy uh, because you are able to uh, get uh, in front of the buyers, you are able to build the report, follow up, follow through, and you have that stamp, you know, falling into supply diversity spend, which right now is hot. It's hot. So we need more suppliers right now. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia, for sharing with us your thoughts on diversity and inclusion and the importance of certification. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pleasure. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions that are coming in. I'm just going to look at them on my screen. Um, if you can get everybody back here. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, the first uh, question I have here is, uh, is Weeby certification process available in French? Uh, so uh, uh, you can uh, uh, submit uh, your information uh, in French, uh, so we will have it translated, we will deal with it, but um, again, it really depends who you want to do business with. A majority of international companies, their opportunities are in English. Their buyers speak English, uh, so um, you still uh, might want to uh, you know, consider um, uh, throwing in somebody who speaks English on the on your supplier diversity uh, uh, file. So our website is available in French. Our process is in French. The entire database can be translated, and uh, we do accept French paperwork. Thank you. Donc pour ceux qui, uh, pour juste répéter la question, est-ce que la certification de Weebee se fait en français? Oui, on peut uh, faire la demande de certification avec Weebee uh, en français uh, et ils pourront vous répondre en français. So thank you, uh, Sylvia. 
la prochaine question, où peut-on trouver des organismes de certification? Je suis propriétaire d'une entreprise en aérospatial et je suis une femme. So, uh, where can we find organizations of certification? This person is a, a woman-owned uh, business in aerospace. So, so yeah, I think all of you have touched a bit on some of the uh, organizations that are out there. Uh, maybe just, Sylvia, like if you just can repeat slowly so people can just can take a quick note of some of the organizations that are out there. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe your team can uh, just take yeah. the links that I posted and I repost them in chat. So uh, VB Canada certifies women-owned businesses. Uh, CAMSI certifies Aboriginal and Visible Minorities. CGLCC certifies LGBTQ2 plus community. Uh, IWSCC certifies veterans and people with disabilities. And CCAB certifies Aboriginal businesses. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, how does CCAB certification help non-Indigenous businesses to work with Indigenous businesses or communities in the future? That would be for David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish I was a CCAB spokesperson here, but um, so, I'm a CCA, so I'm a CCAB CAB certified businesses. So, uh, through joint ventures, you could become a CCAB business. So there we rely on, uh, you have your basically, you'll have to partner with an indigenous supplier like myself, you know, um, then we would create a shareholders agreement that is, uh, you know, 51% owned at a minimum. And the management agreement has to be, uh, you know, uh, where the uh, uh, the indigenous business is, you know, uh, has the controlling say, if you want to say. Um, profits are different, you know, in a way. Sometimes it really, that I think that that's where it kind of gets fuzzy um, because it really brings, you have to really look at it from the value of what each of the partners are bringing. You know, at the very end of the day, so I think that'll determination. Usually, try to go for 50-50. You know, I would say that would probably be the best at the very end of the day. Um, and the other side of the coin, the, the the good thing about it is, and I always turn around and tell non-indigenous businesses, um, the really an interesting way of making your product or services diversity compliant, you know, especially if you're not indigenous business and it opens up a whole new market. And just to give you perspective of what the size of that market, uh, I, I think Sylvia turned around and said that it's less than 2% for women owned businesses. It's less than 0.6 for indigenous businesses, you know, so just to give you perspective on how much the government wants to do. Uh, and now they wanting to go to a 5% you know, within the next couple of fiscal years, they put a target out there. That represents $5 billion in terms of new market, in terms of, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, other parts of the market that with uh, the non-indigenous or the, you know, the CAEs of the world or the other aerospace companies of the world where, where they have their diversity spend, that even sits outside of that. So that's the value of the joint ventures and what they can bring, whether uh, you know, a women-owned business or, uh, a, 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 you know, minority supplier business uh, or a non-indigenous business or it's our indigenous business by partnering. So that that is really the value. Thank you, David. Uh, so we have a question now for Chloe. Uh, your definition of diversity is brilliant as you talk about the different experiences as well. What tools do you provide to ensure that we don't end up with a very with a very like-minded team despite gender diversity? Mm -hmm. I love that question around team. Yeah, because that's the work we do for sure. So, um, so many tools and one of them, as you'll find in the book, is what I call your unique strategic contribution. So what is that? That's the principle that each and every team has a purpose. There's a reason why this team exists within an organization. Same goes for individuals within that team. So I'm not going to go over it today. That's a workshop in itself. But if you want to have a look at it, that's definitely one tool. It's really, really powerful if your team defines their USC and each and every one of the people, the person the members of that team define their USC, then you see the differences and you make sure that they are celebrated and put to contribution. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is obviously you have to hire diverse, like that's the basis, you've got to hire diverse. But once you've got that, if your question, I understand it correctly, is how do you maintain that diversity within that team? So USC. And then last chapter of my book, I talk about how do you conduct meetings 
And how do you make decisions that make sure that we include people in the process? So I talk about the team contract. What are our objectives, our common objectives? How do we measure them and what are the norms? And within the meetings, how do we make sure that everybody has a say and that can speak their mind and that we create a safe space for people to contribute and really uh, participate to this decision making? So in a nutshell, that's what I would say. But if you want more details, I'd say go in and have a read. Yeah, I just want to add just something to what Chloe Chloe said, and, and that's a really excellent question, you know, because how do you break away from groupthink? Um, I, there wasn't one, I had an aha moment. I'm a progressive Aboriginal um, certifier, you know, so I certified, the, you know, corporations and so on and so forth. Uh, there's one leader, one he said to me something very significant, and it was a big aha moment for me to about breaking cycles. Um, they, a lot of the one uh, companies go, uh, leadership actually goes and they work with the industry, you know, associations, right? So it's whether it's power generation or oil and gas and so on and so forth. And they kind of look at their DNI and they have the same strategy because they're all talking amongst each other. What this executive decided to do, he said, you know what, I'm going to go work with CCAB or some of the other ones because I want to break away from the group think I'm going to differentiate myself by understanding how to be different than the rest of the industry is. You know, where's the opportunities? And that was that was the CEO of the company, the president of the company, of a, of a publicly owned company um, that decided to, to, to do that in, in terms of a way of breaking cycles and coming up with new thought by, by working directly with you, with the other organizations. So just, just food for thought along those lines. Thank you, David. Um, we have one question here. Chloe, what is the name of your book? It's called Power Your Team. Empower your team. Empower, yeah. Empower your, team. your team. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm being mindful of time here. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question, and I think it's going to be for Bernard. Um, how will diverse and inclusive suppliers be rated versus non certified uh, suppliers? What mechanism will be used to evaluate this item versus other technology and commercial negotiation items? All right. So I guess. The simple answer, Salima, will be that we will only recognize certified DNI suppliers is the simple answer. And if it's not the case, then we honestly very transparently don't have the resources and manpower to start figuring out whether a supplier is or isn't. So we have to simplify the approach, right? And with SAP Ariba that I talked about earlier, going on RFP, going on RFI, when we're out there looking at new business, that will be a criteria to participate. So it's going to be pretty black and white for us. And uh, as long as you've certified through uh, some of the agencies we've mentioned, uh, that will be the screening check. Okay. I don't know Thank if you. I'm answering the question. Yes, you are. Directly. I think it. Yeah, absolutely. And, Thank and you. Yeah. Could I just add one thing? Because I know some discussion earlier uh, from David as well, just saying like, you know, CAE, we're a manufacturing company, but I, I want people to know that we're really shifting our spend more to technology, more to services. So, you know, 60, 70% of our $2 billion spend is now in services, which I think is a, a touching on everybody here on this call. Every supplier out there has an opportunity to do business with CAE. You know, it's less about big manufacturing supplier suppliers of the past. So there's still a huge opportunity uh, at CAE to do business with us. Just wanted to stick that in at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Much appreciated. And thank you, everybody. Uh, for being here. Thank you for the great questions. Um, I know there's a lot more questions, but I want to be mindful of time because I know people have some other meetings to get to as well. And, and we've been talking uh, uh, quite a bit today. Um, we will try to address some of the questions or you can reach out to myself or anyone else on the panel here today uh, if you want to if you want to reach out to them and, and discuss uh, anything with them directly. So you're always free to do that. Um, so as we've heard today, uh, diversity and inclusion for suppliers is a journey at all levels. And when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we talk about it from four points, uh, the workforce, the workplace, the customer, and the supplier. 
And supplier diversity is the last piece of the puzzle that organizations can engage with to create true inclusion and complete the full cycle of diversity and inclusion. La diversité des fournisseurs offre plusieurs avantages aux organisations qui l'adoptent. Et la certification de la diversité ne fait qu'améliorer la crédibilité des fournisseurs. Ça réduit les coûts, ça améliore la qualité et augmente la fiabilité. So this concludes CAE's first virtual panel discussion on diversity and inclusion, how suppliers can make a difference. We really hope that today's discussion has given you some insights that you may be able to apply in your own organizations. So thank you all again for joining us today, and thank you to Bernard, our panelists, Chloe Caron, David Acco, and our guest speaker, Sylvia Pensac, for sharing their most enlightening thoughts and experiences. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Salima. Thank you, Salima. And, yeah, and thank you, CE, for, for being such a, a trailblazer in that field. Yeah, really. Congratulations, CE. Yeah. Congratulations, CE, put this together. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank, thank you, you all. Yes. Thank you all.